Yeah, let's give Kate a golf clap. How about, that was, that was a lot of information. It is exciting that there's, there's so much going on in the life of redemption. And so if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Mark. We're going to be in Mark chapter 12. We have been camped out on this one day in the life and ministry of Jesus. We're still on Tuesday morning, believe it or not. Like you guys think you have busy days. Jesus' day is just jam-packed. And this is still in, in, that, in this conversation where Jesus has been confronted. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, over and over we've seen Jesus be confronted by these religious authorities. We've seen him kind of confronted and looked uh, tried to be put to shame publicly by the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, kind of the political powers of the day. And Jesus proved his authority that he gets to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, and nothing gets to interfere. And if you were with us last week, we saw the, the kind of the conservatives and the liberals team up in the Pharisees and the Herodians to ask Jesus a question about government and taxes and finances. You know, nice, light, easy conversation topics. Um, and Jesus, again, proved that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And he answered them wisely and well and said that Caesar can have your money, that God wants our hearts. And then lastly, last week, we looked at the Sadducees, kind of the rich elitist behind the scenes who were used to kind of pulling the strings in the way that I said it was like the puppet masters behind the Sanhedrin, behind the Pharisees. Um, these, these men came and questioned Jesus about marriage and eternal life and the resurrection. And again, we saw Jesus prove that he is the ultimate authority. And so that's kind of where we've been camping the last few weeks is just Jesus over and over. It's kind of starting to me to feel a little bit like a conversation with a toddler, where it's just all of these never ending questions. Um, if you've had kids, you know, they just continually, well, why is it like this? Well, what about this? Well, how come this? That's, that's Jesus's Tuesday as he's marching towards Good Friday is just never ending questions. And this morning, we're finally going to get to a good, nay, a great question from a sincere place. And so we're going to look at verses 20, 20, great question asked by a scribe. And as we, as we walk through this passage, it's funny, when I started studying on Monday, I was so excited. I'm like, I get to talk about loving God and loving people. This is going to be awesome. It's going to be great. And as I've sat in this passage, I think there's two ways that we can read this this morning. As we walk through, I think there's a heaviness to the great commandment that you and I could read this and go, oh man, we need to try harder. We need to roll up our sleeves and get to work because this is a heavy and hard and challenging command. And what are we going to do? I think that's one possible response. The second, and where I hope we more often as a church rest, is wow, Jesus is amazing. And so this morning, before we dive into our passage, I just want to pray to that end, that as we walk through what can be a challenging and heavy passage, that you and I would rest not in what we have to do, but in what Jesus has done for us. And so would you pray with me to that end? Father, I thank you that as we walk through this beautiful passage, full of love and challenge and inspiration. And God, I pray that you would stir up our desire and our affection for you. That we would fight the temptation to make this about us and what we can do, but rather, Jesus, that we would fix our eyes on you. That we would be overwhelmed this morning by your goodness, by your grace, and by your fully finished work on the cross. Jesus, I thank you that you are the greatest example of what it looks like to fulfill this command. And would our love come not from a place of trying to earn anything, but being overwhelmed by what you have done for us. Thank you that you loved us first. It's in your mighty name I pray. Amen. 
Amen. Well, let's dive into our passage again. If you have your Bibles, we're in Mark 12. We're going to pick up the story in verse 28. The, uh, Mark tells us that, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, him being Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all. Let's just pause and make sure we understand the scene here. So this scribe, he was kind of a religious lawyer. He was a deep theologian, a deep thinker, a brilliant mind. His job would have been to to take the Old Testament law and write it down perfectly and then pass it on and teach it to other people. And so again, we have seen Jesus questioned by the political people. We have seen him questioned by the conservatives, by the liberals, by the rich and the elite. And now we see him confronted or questioned rather by a theologian, by a lawyer, somebody skilled in debating and conversing the law, the Old Testament. And and it says that this scribe comes up and he is taking part. He's witnessing Jesus go back and forth with the Pharisees. Jesus go back and forth with the Sadducees and the Herodians and the Sanhedrin. He's watching all of this take place. And this, this brilliant thinker who knows the Bible very well sees that Jesus has been answering them well. He's impressed that Jesus knows his stuff. And so he has an opportunity now to speak up and he's going to ask Jesus one question. I just want to like, just for a moment, if you could ask Jesus one question, what would your question be? The, the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of being a prayerfully dependent follower of Jesus is you don't have to only ask Jesus one thing. You can come to him with big things and small things, but this guy gets one shot. He's going to ask one question and his one question is, what is the greatest commandment? He asks him, what's the goat when it comes to commandments? If you follow sports, like the debate that is often raging, and we love this question, don't we? Who's, so if I said, uh, when it comes to basketball, who's the goat, the greatest of all time? That's what goat means. If I just lost you in that, you're like, why are you talking about farm animals all of a sudden? What just happened? Um, that's not in the passage. Where's the sheep? Um, goat stands for greatest of all time. We love these debates. We love these conversations. So if you're, who would be the goat when it comes to basketball? Somebody, crowd part is Michael Jordan. I didn't, I didn't hear any LeBrons, so I'm proud of our church. How about football? When it comes to football, who's the GOAT? We're in Broncos country. The last last time we had a season that wasn't sad, it was Peyton Manning, right? But unfortunately, he's number two. Like, the GOAT is Tom Brady. And he's like COVID. Like, he's back again. Like, he was gone, and now he's back, and he's just never, like, I was like, a a year without, oh, no, he's back. He retired for like three weeks. Uh, But Tom Brady's the GOAT when it comes to football. Like him or hate him, like, he's the GOAT. Uh, let's, Let's go away from sports. How about movies or TV shows? Let's go TV shows. If I was to ask you what the the GOAT, the greatest of all time when it came to TV shows, you know me so well. (laughs) Of course. Some of you would say The Office. I think the most watched like 30 minutes of TV history is the MASH series finale. Like when you adjust for the fact that now every room in our home has a TV, but back then it wasn't so. Like the world like shut down to watch the series finale of MASH, which I watched my first episode of MASH the other day. It's boring. Um, it's no West Wing. Um, it's no West Wing. The, the goat of TV shows is West Wing. If you haven't watched it, you got to go watch it. Um, but we love these debates. You sit around and you talk about what is the greatest of all time. These men were no different. They would sit around and debate When it comes to commandments, there's 613 of them. And they wanted to know, which ones should we emphasize? Some are really heavy and really hard. Others are a little bit lighter. There's there's commandments that tell us what we should do. There's commandments that tell us what we shouldn't do. Which ones should we focus on? What is the goat? That's their question. The greatest of all time. They would sit around and speculate and ponder and argue and debate What is the greatest commandment? And so it seems like this maybe comes a little bit out of left field, but really I think what this religious leader, what this scribe is driving at is, Jesus, this is a conversation that we talk about all the time. Would you give us the answer? Would you help us out? I think he's coming from a place of sincerity. 
He really wants to know. He's seen Jesus answer very wisely a ton of other questions. And so now he's like, give me the answer to the one that plagues most of my conversations. And so this is a great question. And Jesus is going to answer, not surprisingly, with a great answer. Verse 29 says, Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. We'll get to the next verse in just a second. So, Jesus starts out, if you've been tracking and following along and paying close attention, in all of these other conversations that Jesus has had, when he's asked a question, how does he respond? With a question. Because they're not coming with sincere motives and hearts. They're coming to trap Jesus, to test Jesus, to get him into trouble, to try to get him to stumble over his words so that he can be condemned, he can be arrested, um, and they could put him to death. There's, there's sinister motives behind all of those other questions. And so when he's questions, he says, no, 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 I'm not answering your question. I'm gonna turn the tables back on you. This scribe, however, asks a genuine question. And so Jesus doesn't flip the table on him, but rather answers with a great answer. He he answers sincerely. And the way that he starts out is would have been incredibly familiar for this Jewish audience. He says, hear Oh, Israel, at those three words, everybody that's gathered around Jesus knows exactly what he's talking about. This is a quote from Deuteronomy 6, which, became, which is known as the Shema. And in Jewish culture, this was a prayer that they would pray in the morning and they would pray in the evening. They started their days and they ended their days praying this prayer as a family unit. Everything, the beginning, the bookends of their day was centered around this. And so it would not be unlike if I stepped up here this morning and I started out by saying, I have a dream. You guys, everybody would know, oh, he's probably referencing Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech. Because that's it. this is all the more famous than that. This would have, this instantly, everybody would have known exactly what he's talking about. And so I don't do this a lot. I personally just really like to soak in the passage, to sit in the passage that we're teaching through. So I don't do a ton of cross-references. But since Jesus here brings in the cross-reference, I think it would be helpful for us. So if you have your Bibles and you want to flip back to Deuteronomy, and, and if you don't, we'll have it on the screen. Deuteronomy 6, and I've said this before, it's probably one of my favorite Old Testament books. Because it's Moses' farewell address. He's preparing to pass the baton to Joshua. And so imagine, you, you know your time is running short and you're handing off the leadership to somebody else. He wants to give them everything he can think of. And so he's recapping all the beautiful things that God has done while simultaneously charging them to live full of faith and obedience. And so the book of Deuteronomy is one of my favorite Old Testament books. I just love it. And in Deuteronomy 6, let's just look at a portion of what they would have prayed every single morning and every single evening. He says, this is Moses now, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It continues on, but here's why I wanted us to look at this. The Shema, the prayer that these Jewish people would have started their day and ended their day with, starts with loving. God, orienting your day, your heart, your mind around affection for the Father. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just about do I love God, but how does my love for God inform the legacy that I'm leaving behind? The way that I love God when I'm going about my day, when I'm working, when I'm traveling around, when I'm doing the mundane chores and things of life. All of life was to come back to loving God and then he asks them to pass this on, to leave a legacy of love to your children. 
to share this, that Jesus doesn't rescue us out of darkness and into light so that we can just come here and sit and get smarter and, and, and get more knowledge and more information and never share it with anyone else. But rather, we love God because he first loved us and that love then empowers us to leave a legacy of love with those around us. And so this prayer that the Jewish men and women would have prayed is about loving God and leaving a legacy of love with those around us. And and we notice here, and that this is what Jesus is quoting. And so what we're going to do this morning is just going to kind of walk through. I know in a few moments you're going to be like, oh my gosh, he's only three words in. We're going to be here for six hours. I promise I'll get you out before sundown. Um. But I do want to walk, this is the great, when asked what is the most important command, this is Jesus' answer. So I don't want to rush through it. Because if we're off on the greatest command from Jesus, our lives are going to be headed in the wrong trajectory. So let's walk through this slowly. The Lord our God. That's where Jesus starts. That's where Moses started. He says, the Lord. That word in the Hebrew is the word Yahweh which Moses received that name for God at the burning bush. We looked briefly at the burning bush last week. That in that moment, God shows up and speaks to Moses and he says, I am. And kind of the understanding there, that name is Yahweh, that, that, the, that God is the great I am who is present and able to save. So when you see that word Lord, I would underline, highlight right next to it, that it is the I am who is able to save. That is the name that is being used there for God. That is the name that they would pray and proclaim to start their day. Notice though, it's our God. It is Yahweh who is able to save. The great I am is our God. He is a personal, communal God. Just personally, if I can be uh, transparent for a moment, like this has been a tougher season for me personally. And, and this week, as I meditated on that the Lord is our God. You know, when you're, when you're struggling, when you're going through hard times, like it's real easy to feel alone. It's real easy to feel isolated. It's real easy to feel like, man, I'm, I'm in this kind of by myself. And the fact that they would start their day and that when asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, don't forget that the great I am, he's our God. We're in this together. He's in the hard times with us. He's in the great times with us. We are not alone. God is with us. He is Yahweh, the great I am. He's our God. He calls us to do life together. And then the word that we get next is God. That, that word is Elohim, which means God is able. Not only is God able as Yahweh, but he is Elohim. He is mighty and powerful. Our God is the great I am, and he's powerful and mighty to save. And so a little bit of a tangent, but as I sat this week with God, Jesus here gives us two names for God. He reveals and, 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 and brings back the Shema to this scribe, giving us two names of God. Um, so at the end of our service this morning, we're going to spend some time praying. And we've got some prayer stations, if you look in the back corner over here, set up, and there'll be people back there to pray. But I also went and found a resource from Navigator's website where there's 31 characteristics and names for God. And so it would be a month of, and it's laid out kind of like a calendar. And my encouragement to you, as we want to grow as a church in our prayerful dependency, is one of the ways that maybe you could grow in your prayer life is to spend some time praying the different names and attributes of God. And so um, if during the, the communion and prayer time or at the conclusion of our service on your way out, they're located on those back tables, I would encourage you to grab one and spend some time over this next month as we're marching towards Easter, as in, in the study of Mark, we're headed towards Good Friday. Like, what might God do in your heart if you spend time focusing on who he's revealed himself to be, the way we see him revealing himself here is as the great I am who is mighty and powerful to save. That's where this prayer starts. When asked, he says, I am able to save. I am powerful to save. And, and we're to listen to him. He says, the Lord our God. And then he says, the Lord is one. 
This was important for them and is just as important for us. The Jewish people at this time were surrounded by people who believed in many gods, a polytheistic culture, that there were lots of ways to get to God and that they they had gods for the sun and the moon and the stars and the wind and the waves and, and the seasons and fertility and many gods for all sorts of things. And we might, and they had statues and it just, I mean, they were inundated with this. And so for them daily to remind themselves in prayer that there's one God was a vital importance for them. And now while you and I may not walk out and see statues pointing and worshiping false gods, I do think we are surrounded by people. We are surrounded by the temptation to believe in many gods and in false gods. We can easily believe in the God of money. We can easily believe in the God of power. We can easily believe in the God of safety. And anytime you elevate anything above the one true God who is Yahweh and Elohim, who is powerful and mighty and present to save, we're in danger. And so they would daily remind themselves, there's one God. There's one way. It was of utmost importance for them. I think it's of utmost importance for us to orient our mind and heart around there's one God. And this is gonna be all the more beautiful next week when Jeff gets to come and preach and talk about how there's one God, but he reveals himself in three persons. And we're gonna get to see that next week. So cliffhanger teaser. And also now I gotta tell Jeff he's gotta teach that. Um, But uh, verse 30. So we're supposed to acknowledge There's one God. He's Yahweh and Elohim. He's present and able to save. Verse 30, what are we supposed to do with that information? You shall love the Lord your God. Well, how do we love God? I think it starts out by not following false gods. I think it's helpful maybe to think of it in the context of a marriage. If on August 21st, 2004, I stood across from my bride in front of my friends and family and said, you're my wife, I love you, I'm devoted to you, you have my heart and my affection. And then on, we got married on a Saturday. On Sunday, I was like, cool, I'm gonna keep dating other women though. That's not a healthy marriage. That's not loving her well. That would break and fracture and, and be horrible. And yet you and I can do this with God all the time. We say we love God on Sundays because we're we're prone to want to compartmentalize things. We're prone to want to say, well, God, you can have my Sundays, but Monday through Friday at work, that's for me. And I'll give you small group time too, but but I'm going to be God over what I watch. I'm going to be God over what I read, what I listen to. The first way that we love God is, is we stop following after false gods. And then he's gonna give us some some ways and some things that we need to surrender to God if we're going to love him well. He says, with all your heart. Again, if you write in your Bibles, and I haven't said this, I don't think, in a while, but I had a pastor one time say that a a, a worn-out Bible represents a put-together life. I want us to be a church of worn-out Bibles where we are highlighted and marked up and written in. And if that makes you uncomfortable, I understand we can disagree on that. Um, But man, like, like we should be wearing out our Bibles. And so if you write in your Bibles where it says heart, maybe right next to it real small, write the word emotions, because that's what Jesus is driving at here. Love God with your emotions. He says, love the Lord with your emotions, with your heart, And then he says, and with your soul, with all your soul. Um, Little Greek lesson, that word all, it means all. That's all, it means everything. Doesn't mean some of it, it means all of it. All your soul, that's your spirit, that's your spirituality. So we're to love God with our, we're we're to love God emotionally, we're to love God spiritually, and then he says, love God with all your mind. That's your intellect, your wisdom, your discernment your brain. And finally, and with all your strength, that's your, that's your physical nature, that's your body, that's your actions, that's the things that you do. And so here's what Jesus is driving at. And here's what Moses was driving at. Love God with your whole being, with everything you are. But in our brokenness, we don't like being whole people. We prefer to, again, compartmentalize. We prefer to say, well, you can have some of this, but not all of it. And so I think there's some dangers here that we need to talk about. If we love God with everything but our hearts, 
with our emotions. If we say, I'm going to hold on to those. So you can, have my, you can have my intellect. You can have my spirituality. And you can have my hands and the things that I work, the things that I do. But I'm not going to let you have my emotions. I'm not going to let you feel. I'm not going to give you my feelings. We are going to become people who are easily overwhelmed by our emotions, ruled and controlled by them because they're not surrendered to the Father, or distant, unfeeling people who just reject any and all emotions. And so there's a great danger if we don't surrender and love God with our heart. If we love God with everything but our soul, if we withhold our souls, you will become a religious, legalist, zealot jerk. Because it's all going to be about what you know and what you do and what you feel is best. And you'll never have your affections stirred up for the Lord. Your spirit will never be in awe and captivated. And really, you're going to live a white-knuckled kind of religion that Jesus has spent most of Tuesday combating and saying, that's not the right way to do it. That's not what I came to prove. That's not how you're supposed to live. And so to withhold your soul turns us into a form of legalism that pushes us further away from Jesus rather than loving him more more deeply. If we love him with everything but our mind, if we say, you can have my heart, you can have my emotions, you can have my soul and my spirituality, and you can have my strength, I'll do things for you. But when it comes to growing in wisdom, when it comes to growing in intellect, when it comes to the things I think about, when it comes to the things that I know, I'm not going to pursue truth. I'm not going to dig deeper. You will be a shallow and easily led astray follower of Jesus. If you stay stuck in milk and never mature into meat, you're going to be you're going to be consumed by the things of this world. You're going to be really passionate about some, some elementary truths, but you never dig deeper and discover the riches and the wonder that is God's word. And remember last week, if you were with us, Jesus with the Sadducees says, this is why you're wrong. You don't know the word. So it's important that we are growing in our intellect, that we're digging into the word of God. We're seeking to devour and, and, and understand deeper elements of theology and, and have deeper conversations and, um, and grow in our love, in our mind for the Lord. And then lastly, if we withhold our strength, our physical nature, the things that we do with our bodies, we say, you can have my heart you can have my soul, and you can even have my mind, but I'm going to separate that out, and then I'm going to do whatever feels good and feels right. You're going to live a double life. Or, quite possibly, you'll fall into what's historically been known as hedonism, where you say, well, God has my spiritual nature, but with my physical body, I get to do whatever I want. And that's dangerous. And the command here, not the suggestion, the command is that we love God with all of our emotions, with all of our spirituality, with all of our intellect, and with all of our strength, with all of our physical nature, with everything, as a whole person. Can I be discouraging for a little bit? A little more maybe discouraging? We've all messed this up during this sermon, myself included. We can't do, this is impossible. And he says, this is the only thing you need to focus on. Everything you got, love God. And we have never done this well. Not a day in your life. We should take up an offering. Like, anybody, like that's heavy. That's why I said, there's a danger here that we could read this and say, we got to roll up our sleeves and get to work. But if I could be encouraging... We've been studying the life and ministry of Jesus most of this year. And every moment along the way, when Jesus is casting out demons, he's loving God with everything he has. When he's being confronted last week by the religious leaders, he's loving the Father perfectly. When he's calming the wind and the waves, he's loving the Father perfectly. When he's teaching and training the disciples, he's loving the Father perfectly. When he's being confronted by Peter and told, we should just hang out on this mountaintop and we should, he's loving the Father perfectly. Jesus is the ultimate example. Every moment of his story, he is fulfilling this command because he knows we can't. And so for you and I, this should stir up 
our spirit, our souls, to say, look what Jesus did for us. He is the ultimate example of loving the Father perfectly. Every step along the way, he's loving God with his heart, with his soul, with his mind, and his strength. I find it interesting, if you're, if you're really paying attention, when we read from Deuteronomy, Jesus added something to the Shema that wasn't in Deuteronomy. Here he says, love the Lord with your heart, with your soul, and in, in Deuteronomy he said with your might. But Jesus adds our intellect. He adds the mind component. That wasn't present in Deuteronomy. Jesus says, he, he's going even deeper and creating this whole picture, saying even the things that you think about, the things that you read, the things that you know, you need, they need to stir up your love and affection for God. We're to love him with everything we have. And again, I think it's important for us to know, we love God because he loved us first, not to earn his love. This is why we don't roll up our sleeves and say, we got to get to work. No, we should be in awe of Jesus because he loved us first. So now we get to pursue loving him with everything we have. It's because we were loved, not to earn it, but because we've already received that love. And then I love that Jesus gives him more than he asked for. He asks for one. Jesus says, well, this is too good to pass up. I got to give you two. So verse 31, he says, the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He cannot distinguish loving God from loving others. He says, first you start with the vertical. Go to God. Love him with everything you got. But as you love God, it's going to pour out onto how you interact with other people. That, that because God loves people, and as you fall in love with God, you will love others. And so, who are our neighbors? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, at this time, is it just the people who live right next door to you? Uh, yes and no. It absolutely starts with where God has you. I say this often. It's wherever you live, work, shop, eat, play. That God has people around you. And so maybe a great exercise this week would be for you to sit down and like blueprint your street. And do you know the names of the people who live on your street? Are there ways that you can be praying and blessing and serving and sacrificially entering in and sharing your story or, or just being present on the street? street that God has you on. Those are absolutely your neighbors that God has you there on purpose for a purpose, but I don't think it stops there. The understanding here is Jesus is telling this would have been the people that you do life with. So the people at your gym, the people at your office, the people at your school, the people that you sit next to at work, those are all people that would be considered your neighbors that God, again, has you there on purpose for a purpose. So When was the last time you sacrificially loved somebody in your circle? But here's my personal conviction as I've sat with this command. I don't think it stops there either. Because you and I live in a globally connected world that I can have a really good friend who lives in pastors in Virginia that though we've not seen each other in quite a few years with a simple text or a phone call or a Facebook update, I can know what's happening and be involved to some degree and care and love him and what he's going through. Just because you move away doesn't mean we stop being aware of what's happening in your life, that we are a very connected society. And so While what's happening in Ukraine, those are not our neighbors, we know and are aware so we can love and we can pray and we can look for opportunities to serve. And so I would say that that is an opportunity for us to love our neighbors, even though it's not right here in Loveland. If we know and are aware of what's happening, we should love and care. And so maybe... Today, when we close down and we have a time of prayer, when we have a time of communion, maybe one of the ways that you can love is to just spend some time praying for the horrific situation that's happening right now in Ukraine with Russia and the churches in Poland that are standing in the face of adversity and some of the amazing things that God's church is doing in this season. Like, how are we seeking to join through prayer? Let's not shortchange how powerful prayer is. We have that opportunity to love and care and and do that this morning. 
And so Jesus says, love God. He says, love others. And notice, he says, there is no other commandment greater than these. Again, if you write in your Bible, that word greater could be read louder, which I just think is cool. There's no other com- That was awesome. Do that in the second service too. That was perfect. There is no other commandment louder than this, that God wants to scream this at us. Love me and love each other. Nothing is louder in God's word than that. The problem this morning isn't, can we hear God's voice? The problem is, are we listening? God's voice is loud. It's not soft. He wants us to know this. He's screaming it at us. The problem is we don't listen. And I marveled this week at the scribe. Again, this brilliant thinker. This deep theologian who knows the words so well. Let's look at his response in verse 32 and 33. The scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. He repeats the Shema kind of back to Jesus. Is, and again, I'm, I'm just highlight this. This is huge. Much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. For him to admit this is huge. He just said, who we love and worship is more important than what we do. That real religion starts with a relationship. It's about our worship, not about our work. This is huge for him to admit. That they're standing in the temple and he's going, it's more important who we love than what's going on over there with all the sacrifices. That God wants our hearts before he wants our hands. For him to acknowledge this is massive, so much so that look at what Jesus says. And and when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, again, we've seen a couple of times where, where his sovereignty is just on display, that he is fully God. He knows what's going on in this man's heart. And so he sees that he answers wisely, and he tells him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. I think that's an encouragement from King Jesus. He's like, you're on the right track. Keep asking good questions. Keep running after me. You're looking, for the, you're looking in the right places. You're heading in the right direction. Keep going. And then lastly, it says, after that, no one dared ask him any questions. They got nothing left. And actually, I, I just I kind of skimmed through to the end of the book of Mark. The next time a non-disciple is going to ask Jesus a question, is I think in Mark 14, he's going to be standing in front of the chief priests and they're going to say, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And he's going to respond all throughout Mark. What have we seen? When somebody calls him the Messiah, he goes, shh, not yet. No, don't let him know that yet. It's not time. The next question Jesus gets asked is, are you the Messiah? And you know how he's going to respond? He's going to say, I'm Yahweh. I am the Christ, the Son, and you're going to see me coming in power, coming from heaven on the clouds of heaven. The next time Jesus is asked a question after this one, he's going to declare he is God and it's going to get him killed so that you and I can experience the love from God. And then we can in turn love him and love others. And so here's how I want us to respond. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. We take communion a lot, uh, and we have the elements up here this morning. Um, I'm going to ask that this morning be different. We're going to have people in the back. um, Just as the Lord has stirred, maybe this morning you just need time for, for prayer. You need somebody to pray with you about how you've been loving God, where you've not been loving God. Um, Maybe this morning you need somebody to just pray with you about a neighbor, a friend, a coworker. Um, There'll be a handful of us back there ready and eager to pray. I would invite you to take, here's, we have, we're gonna sing three songs. And in these next three songs, I want you to do what you need to do. And so we have the elements up here. It's an awesome opportunity to commune with God, to remember his broken body and his shed blood. Um, Come and take the elements. If you need prayer 
for whatever the Lord is stirring in your heart, we'll be back there. I would encourage you to come and pray. If you need to come grab a sheet and go back to your, to your seat and start uh, just praying and reflecting on the character and attributes of God, do that. If, if in, this, in this passage, you have had your heart stirred to, there's somebody in this room that I need to go have a conversation with, do that now. Here's what I, don't waste this space. Let's be a family, a people that in these next few moments is loving God with everything we have and then seeking to love each other. So what I don't want us to do is be distracted by what each other is doing. So if you need to kneel and repent, kneel and repent. If you need to stand and sing and lift your hands, stand and sing. Let us not be distracted, but rather let us love God and love each other. Let's pray.